and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we are going to look at the last deaths included in the GEC Marconi mystery and have a look at some theories that are included in these cases. Once again, the book Open Verdict by Tony Collins has been a very important source for this series. All information is included in the show notes. If you haven't already listened to the first two episodes in this series, then go back and listen now, so that it all makes sense. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. On the 24th of April 1987, Mark Wisner was working as a software engineer at the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment. The A and AEE was a research facility based at Boscombe Down in Wiltshire. The facility was primarily used for research into military aviation and had existed since 1918. It was crucial during the Second World War when aviation was the key to success and new developments meant possibly winning the war. In 1992, research was moved to the Defence Research Agency and less emphasis was put on the Boscombe Down site. Mark Wisner was working on the military site in 1987, and was reported as being a computer software engineer. He lived with two of his colleagues, and it is reported that it was one of his colleagues that discovered that Mark was dead. The night before Mark was discovered, his colleague had noted that he could hear Mark's TV on in his room, and nothing seemed odd about this at the time. Mark had been at home for a few hours alone before one of his colleagues had returned home. When the colleague woke up the next morning, he could still hear Mark's TV on in his room. The colleague knocked on his door and got no reply, and he left for work as normal. The colleague was bothered, however, that he had not seen Mark, and rang the house a number of times that day to try and get through to him. He returned home at dinner time and found a parcel for Mark and tried to knock on his door again, but got no reply. At half past two that day he returned home again and this time he discovered that Mark was lying on the bedroom floor and it was clear that he was dead. The circumstances around his death were tragic and odd and it was a very alarming sight. Mark was on the bedroom floor with a plastic bag tied around his neck and three layers of cling film was wrapped around his head, with a hole for his mouth. There was also a tube of glue inside the bag, with some of the glue squeezed out of it. What had happened to Mark, and what were the circumstances leading up to his death? There was an inquest ordered in Mark's death, and this took place five days later. The cause of his death was ruled as asphyxia, The inquest discussed the fact that this could have been related to a sexual act. The pathologist discussed how lack of oxygen can heighten sexual arousal and that this is what may have happened in this case. Suicide was not considered and it was ruled that it was an unfortunate accident. The ruling of it as an accident or sexual misadventure appears to be corroborated by reports that Mark was wearing high-heeled women's boots suspenders and a PVC top. This suggested that perhaps it had been a sexual related accident. However, it was not necessarily an open and shut case, like many of them related to these cases. There is not much reported about what Mark did as a job, but it is clear that he would have been privy to some classified information about new developments and technologies. A couple of weeks after Mark Wisner's death, another death occurred. On May 3rd, 1987, Michael Baker was on his way to a fishing trip with two friends when his car crashed into the central reservation and became overturned on the other side of the road, close to Poole in Dorset. The incident killed 22-year-old Michael Baker, but his two passengers were unhurt. Michael worked for Plessy. The Plessy company was a British electronics defence and telecommunications company. They were involved in defence contracts and telecommunication projects, including working with British Telecom for the modernisation of the telephone network. In 1985, GEC Marconi put in a takeover bid for Plessy, 
which was blocked. In 1988, GEC and Siemens conducted a hostile takeover of Plessy, which took place in 1989. Today, both Plessy and the Marconi Company have been amalgamated into BAE, the British Aerospace Company. Plessy, therefore, were involved in many ways with GEC Marconi in 1987, and Michael Baker, as a scientist for Plessy, would have been aware of what was happening with both companies and what they were working on. It is believed that Michael did not want to originally go on the trip and had expressed that he didn't want to go. However, it is stated that someone turned up at the door and Michael decided to go on the fishing trip. This seemed unusual to Michael's family, as it was contrary to what Michael had said. At the inquest, it was ruled that it was an accident, and that Michael must have lost concentration momentarily. This ruling has been questioned, however, as in the book Open Verdict, it is said that there were no skid marks on the road to imply that Michael had attempted to stop the car, or even slow down. It is also believed that he was not going at an excessively fast speed when the incident occurred. The death of Michael Baker, despite being ruled an accident, still caused some to wonder what might have really happened, as not all questions were answered. In January 1988, Russell Smith was working as a lab technician at the Atomic Energy Research Establishment in Harwell, Oxfordshire. This establishment was the main centre for nuclear research in the UK. The centre was set up just after World War II and was decommissioned as late as the 1990s. In January, it is known that Russell travelled to Boscastle in Cornwall. Boscastle is a village and fishing port in Cornwall which has some beautiful coastal views. It is reported, however, that in January that year, Russell died after falling off a cliff in the village. Russell's death was ruled as a suicide, as it appeared to have the features of this kind of death. There is not lots of information available about Russell's death. However, it is clear that once again, he would have been privy to information that would have been sensitive and possibly classified. It was only a couple of months before another death of a Marconi employee occurred. In March 1988, 52-year-old Trevor Knight was working at Marconi Defence Systems at Stanmore in Middlesex. Notably, this is where Arshad Sharif, who we covered in episode 1, worked before his death. On Friday the 25th of March 1988, Trevor was found dead at his home. It is reported that he was discovered in his car with a hosepipe leading from the exhaust into the car. The fumes had caused his death. This death resembled a number of other deaths that we have covered in relation to these cases, and on first glance appeared to be a tragic suicide. The inquest certainly seemed to think that a suicide was possible. It was documented that Trevor did not enjoy his work and had suffered with some pain over the years that caused him trouble. Nobody in Trevor's inner circle of family and friends, however, said that he had ever given any indication that he wanted to harm himself. The book Open Verdict also discusses that there were some notes left on the kitchen table that were discovered after Trevor's death. The contents of these notes were not divulged to anyone and it had only been speculated that they may have been suicide notes. His death was officially ruled a suicide. The fact that Trevor Knight had worked in a similar field to Arshad Sharif implied that he too would have been privy to the same sensitive information, important to national security. It is also relevant to note that Trevor had also worked for Marconi Underwater Systems, which is where Vimal Dajbai was working before his death. Trevor was connected with the same branches of the company, and while this may not necessarily mean anything, it is an odd connection. In August 1988, the deaths of Alistair Beckham and Brigadier Peter Ferry became known to the public. Their deaths were linked by some due to the manner in which they both died. Both men had seemingly electrocuted themselves. Alistair Beckham worked for the Plessy Company under the Plessy Naval Division. 
His role was listed as quality control engineer, and by all accounts he was very competent at his job. On one Sunday morning in August, Alistair took his wife to work for a shift starting at 7am. Alistair's wife was under the impression that he was going to be doing some DIY around the house, as he did not work at the weekends. The pair had had a pleasant and normal conversation in the car, and there was nothing to suggest that anything was wrong with Alistair, or that anything was bothering him. His wife returned from work later on that day, and discovered that she could not find Alistair anywhere. She realised that the shed door was locked, and she went to get a neighbour to help her prise open the door. When she eventually got it open, she discovered something awful. Alistair was sitting on a chest with his back against the wall. He had electrocuted himself by wiring himself to the mains. It was also noted that he had a handkerchief inside his mouth. The scene was strange and very unusual. The door had been locked from the inside, but it appeared that up until that moment, Alistair had been going about his business as usual, and had got some items out to do some work around the house. It did not appear that he was preparing to do anything different than normal. It was surprising to those around Alistair that he would have done this to himself, but the door locked from the inside implied that he must have locked it himself. The way in which it was done, however, was not usual for a suicide, and this is very similar to a number of other deaths that we have covered in this series. When looking into Alistair's life, there was no obvious reason that he would have decided to take his own life. His marriage was good and there did not seem to be any problems in his life that would lead to his death. There were no reasons that anyone could think of as to why Alistair would choose to do this, and while this can be sometimes the case with people who commit suicide, no rational explanation could be reached about what happened. Alistair's death was ruled an open verdict, due to the fact that no concrete conclusion could be reached. Brigadier Peter Ferry had been working as a business development manager for Marconi, and during the week lived in a cottage in the grounds of a Marconi factory that was located near Camberley in Surrey. It is known that Peter would return home to Wiltshire at the weekends. On the 23rd of August, a cleaner who worked on the grounds discovered that she could not enter Peter's cottage, and that she had recently seen some sparks coming out of the room. The book Open Verdict discusses that upon entering, one of Marconi's personal directors saw that a plug was half in a socket behind the door. He could also hear what sounded like electrical discharges. He then spotted Peter's body lying behind the door. When the scene was investigated, it was discovered that Peter had attached an electrical lead to his teeth and had switched on the electricity. Like Alistair Beckham, he had electrocuted himself using the mains. Brigadier Peter Ferry's death, however, was slightly different, as it was known by a number of people that he had been depressed in the weeks leading up to his death. This was attributed to the fact that he had been in a car accident around three weeks before his death. Peter was hit by a truck that had been travelling down the wrong side of the road at around 65 miles per hour, and Peter had become trapped inside the car due to the incident. This had caused him a lot of distress, and he had not been the same person since the incident. Despite not suffering major injuries, Peter was suffering psychologically, according to his family and colleagues. The book Open Verdict explains that Peter's wife discussed that Peter had tried to drown himself in a river three days before his death, but he couldn't as the river was too shallow. Despite it seeming like this was a suicide, there were more unanswered questions such as the manner of death was not commonly seen in suicides and the fact that just before he died he had been involved in a car accident. Trevor Knight had also been involved in a minor car accident, just before his own death, and car accidents have been included a lot with the men in these cases. Despite both men working at different companies, there is no doubt that their work would have had crossovers, 
and the way in which they both died was extremely similar, and very close together in time. Both deaths received the same ruling, an open verdict due to the many unanswered questions surrounding both of them. One of the last deaths often listed with these cases in reports is the death of Andrew Hall. There is not many reports about his death, but it is known that he worked for British Aerospace as an engineering manager. While this is not Marconi, it is known that the Marconi Company later became British Aerospace, or BAE. In September 1988, just one month after Alistair Beckham and Peter Ferry's deaths, Andrew Hall was also found dead. It is reported that he had placed a hosepipe from his exhaust and put it into his car, causing his death by carbon monoxide poisoning. This is a cause of death which we have seen in many other cases, however each time it appears that the coroner has reached a different verdict. In Andrew's case they ruled that it was a suicide. As there is not much information on the case, I am unsure how they reached this verdict. However, there must have been some circumstances which led them to this conclusion. The manner of his death is one that is prominent in these cases, and therefore his death has been included in this list of cases, and due to the work that he did with British Aerospace. The fact that the same frequency of deaths reported in these industries did not continue after 1988 have led people to believe that these deaths are in some way linked together. Since 1988 there have not been the same level of reports about odd circumstances surrounding the deaths of people in the defence industry. It is of course relevant to say that many of the companies where these people worked have either diversified or merged with other companies since that decade. There were more deaths that have been included in some reports about the Marconi mystery, but not in other reports, such as the death of John Whiteman, who reportedly drowned in his bathtub, surrounded by alcohol bottles and pills. The first assumption was that John had tried to commit suicide. However, it is reported that when the autopsy was conducted, no traces of alcohol or substances were found in his system. The fact that nothing could be found in his system, but the evidence of it was clearly found at his home, led some to link it to the Marconi cases, due to the odd circumstances. The book Open Verdict discusses that many of these cases can be put into different categories. Accident, suicide or murder. The question is, were any of them murder, and were any of them connected? At the end of these three episodes, I think it is still very difficult to say. Some of these cases clearly demonstrated elements of accidental death and some had features that could have been contributed to the person committing suicide. The strange circumstances surrounding Arshad Sharif and Vimal Dajbai and their almost identical trips to a place they did not know caused some concern. So does the death of Shani Warren. Shani Warren's death stands out particularly due to the fact that she is the only woman included in this list of cases, and she did not necessarily have the technical knowledge that the other people had in their roles. The idea that Shani somehow tied herself up and drowned herself in the lake does not sound plausible to me, and it certainly does not seem like something that someone would do to themselves. To me, Shani's death has many of the hallmarks of foul play. The other cases present issues. Of course, the number of deaths caused many to be alarmed, as it appears that a huge number of people included in this industry have met with some very strange circumstances. It can of course be said that it is a very big industry, with lots of people working in it, and that suicide amongst males is quite high. This is something that is noticeable in the statistics. A report done by the Samaritans states that in 2017, 6,213 deaths occurred in the UK. 4,694 of those were male. It is positive to say that these rates are the lowest that they have been for 30 years. This notion of suicide and its statistics were mentioned in a report that was done into the deaths at the time. Due to the public interest and the newspapers picking up the stories of these people, 
Marconi felt it necessary to commission an internal inquiry into the deaths in 1988. The company hired a former officer at New Scotland Yard, Brian Worth, to conduct the inquiry. The book Open Verdict contains the results of the inquiry. Brian Worth states that his role in the inquiry was to look at the deaths of people working directly for Marconi and not in related companies to see if there were any connections or linking factors. He concludes that the ratio of three suicides a year in the 35,000 workers was not dissimilar to the national average of suicides at the time of 10 in 100,000 people when doing a rough comparison. He also concluded that the methods of suicide that were carried out in cases were strange but not necessarily unique. He also made a point to discuss that the newspapers had called these men scientists and that they were not all scientists and this had caused confusion in the papers. Brian Worth concluded that there were no outside influences and that there was nothing to support what was believed to be a conspiracy theory. While it is good that Marconi conducted this inquiry, it seems a little limited, as of course this only looked at cases that were deemed to be suicides, and does not take into account the other number of cases that were labelled as accidents, or were given open verdicts. Of course it also does not take into account the deaths of people in related fields and companies, as it was only Marconi that conducted an inquiry. The factor of a stressful working environment should of course be considered, and the industries that they worked in would for sure have caused a lot of stresses and strains in everyday life. Unfortunately, this inquiry did not close the door on the speculation, and to this day people are still discussing whether any of these were connected. I have been unable to reach a conclusion about this question. I believe that the strange circumstances of the deaths were indeed odd, and do not necessarily match up to the rulings in each case. Some deaths appear similar, and lead me to wonder about what may have happened in them. However, it would of course be just speculation to say. I think it's extremely sad for the families of these people that do not believe that their loved one committed suicide, or was involved in a fatal accident, as they have been unable to get any answers from authorities about what might have happened to them and I am extremely grateful to Tony Collins for publishing Open Verdict, as it really does give the victims a voice and allows people to read about their stories. In 1999, the GEC Marconi Company merged with British Aerospace and became BAE Systems. To date, there has not been any more significant published reports about suspicious deaths in these industries since the years 1982 to 1988. Thank you for listening to today's episode. The podcast is officially a year old this week, so if you've supported us by listening or sharing the podcast, then thank you. If you are a new listener and want to support us more, you can leave us a review on iTunes or just share the podcast with someone you know would enjoy it. I have loved every minute of podcasting this year and I hope everyone has enjoyed listening. If you want to suggest any cases for the upcoming year, you can email us at theunseenpod at gmail.com or find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram to share what you think. Listen until the end today to hear a promo from a relatively new podcast called Whispered True Stories, Stories Told in a Whisper. Once again, thank you for listening and as always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen.
because I'm hiding from someone or on the run. <laughs> the reason why I am whispering is because I want to tell you a secret. Only a few people know so far, and this is the secret. I am the host of a new podcast which will tell stories of true crime, weird disappearances, strange mysteries, wild adventures, spooky things, funny things, and also stories that listeners ask me to tell. But these stories will be spoken entirely in whisper, and every story will be 100% true. In fact, the podcast is called Whispered Drew Stories. <laughs> For many people, hearing a story that is told in whisper makes it much more interesting to hear. And listening to a whispered mystery or a true crime story at night has often been found to be relaxing or even comforting for people who have difficulty in falling asleep. Now, I will mention one last thing. Over the past several months, as the co-host of a podcast, I have received many comments from listeners about my voice and how soothing it is when they listen to me tell a story. So, I'm hopeful that the combination of whisper and my voice will give you as much pleasure as all of those very sweet comments have given to me. Be sure to remember the name of the show, Whispered True Stories. Look for 